about um, benefit, no, equality, equality, and we're talking about equality as a, let me just fix this, sorry. Um, Um, we're talking about equality specifically as a metaphysical proposition. Okay, so we're talking specifically about the question are humans equal? Okay, so if we're going to answer that question, okay, well, there's two things we need to know is what is a human and then what does it mean to be equal? Alright, so this is something that we're sort of taught is really nice and lovely and it's, wouldn't it be wonderful if we should everyone's equal and we should treat everyone equally and they should have equal opportunities and we can just picture this beautiful world where everyone's the same or equal. Um, so what is a human? So let's, um, I want to get you guys to tell me a couple of ideas, but I'm going to restrict the lens, okay? If you were a materialist, okay, so that means you think everything is just made of atoms, what is a human? Now, just atoms. Excellent. So that is one answer. A human is just a bunch of atoms. All right, what about if you were a Christian? If we we're going to ask a Christian, um, what is a person? What might they say? What is a human? Child of God. Child of God. Perfect. That's exactly what I have written down. I would say you're a child of God. Okay, if we were to ask Aristotle, who can remember what Aristotle said a human is? He said... A child of Zeus. That's right. He said, he said a rational animal. So a type of animal, but with rational faculties, and specifically a soul, an essence. The soul was the essence. Um... What about, can we think of any other ideas, any other answers to this question? What is a human? Well, it's not limited to those three. Does anyone want to volunteer what they think a human is? All right. Um, it's probably also necessary, if we're talking about what a human is, to talk about the temporal limits of a human. Um, does, a, uh, does a human have to be alive? All right, so if you have a dead body in the morgue, is it a human? Is the body of a human, is it a human? Um, obviously, if you're not equal to a living human, all right, because doctors are allowed to perform experiments, aren't they? They're allowed to practice performing surgeries on um, dead bodies. Any other ideas for what it means to be a human? So then, what, what about like equal? What does it mean for two things to be equal? And so if we're speaking specifically mathematically, it means they're the same, they have the same um, physical properties. All right, now obviously that's not a good, uh, a good description of humans being equal, is it? The same physical properties, because you know, some people are taller, some people are shorter, some people have blonde hair, some people have brown hair, so we're not all the same physically. What might another idea of equal be to say that humans are equal? Same rights. They have the same rights, excellent. Okay, they all have equal rights. And so what that is, is they're equal before, you might say, the law. Equal before the law. Okay, and that probably, um, you know, a, a good answer, I think, for what it means in our society. And again, if we were to look at it through a Christian lens, lens, you might say equal in the eyes of God. That all people are equal in the eyes of God. So I think that's pretty good. Uh, but like, we're right. But some of the problems are um, not everyone is the same. Not everyone's the same. And so when we talk about humans being equal, we treat them as equal before the law, but they're not physically the same. And it creates some problems treating them equally. Um, firstly, so that proposition, um, all humans are equal. Let's, uh, Jensen, can you read that for me? We hold these truths to be self-evident, 
that all men are created equal, that they are endowed by their creator with a certain unalienable rights. And among these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. And what document is it from? Remember? The Constitution. The, uh, the American Declaration of Independence, yeah. So that's the American, when they're separating themselves from England, they're saying we're going to be our own nation, and our Declaration of Independence, they're going to say um, that everyone is equal in the eyes of their creator, and that everyone um, has unalienable rights that you can't remove from them. These being life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. And this was used later by those in opposition to the um, in opposition to slavery. So as a justification for why the slaves should be free. Um, so the question then is, if we're going to say that humans are equal, the, the claim here is that they have to be created equal. Alright, so as a metaphysical proposition, all humans are equal. Alright, for that to be true objectively, true regardless of opinion, does that require a creator? So we can say, um, like, um, according, to, according to this, it says so, yep. Um, we're not talking about physical property, but perhaps if we're talking about equality before the law, we can restrict it to that domain. We can say, what about just before the law? All humans are equal. Just before the law, the law is created by humans, and so that would be that we don't need creators to maintain that proposition when we restrict it to the domain of law. But if we're talking about equal transcending law, if law can say this is a social construct, then we would say, um, say yes. So it depends on the domain with which we ask the question. Okay, so um, who has seen, uh, I don't know what's going on here. Who has seen this comic before? For a fair selection, everybody has to take the same exam. Okay, please climb that tree. Okay, so this is, an, this is an example of a test, right? Um, everyone has the same test, but the problem is um, some people are going to be really good at this test, climbing the tree, whereas others might find it a bit challenging. Okay, the fish might find it a bit challenging. So when, if you go on to study teaching, this is one of the things they present to you and they tell you your students are like these animals, you know, they've all got different gifts and talents, and, you know, try and get the monkey to swim in the water. Like, the monkey can climb the tree well, but that's only one type of test. Uh, and so it's obviously true that humans are very different. So how can we, how can we make them, how can we treat them all equally if they're so very different? And is that a good idea to treat them equally before the law? So let's see. We've probably seen this image before. Yep, okay, so just pointing out the difference between what is equality and what is equity? Equity, this sort of golden ideal, because it's acknowledging, yes, people aren't equal, people are different, and so what we should do then, this is gonna be fantastic, we're gonna create this utopia where those that don't have the same characteristics that allow them to flourish are given more so that they have the same opportunity to flourish. Okay. Um, but again, people are radically different. Okay, so when we talk about just biological differences with people, okay, some people, like your height dictated by your genetic code, okay, plus nutrition, you need to give them a correct amount of nutrition, so the height that you'll go to. And generally speaking, the taller you are, the more athletic you are, okay? Generally speaking as well, like the, the better your metabolism, the, sort of, the thinner you'll be, the more athletic you will be. And that endows all kinds of advantages in both of you. Well, firstly, like if we're talking in hunter-gatherer days, a survival advantage, and then even in today's day and age, competition. Um, even time born during the year, I think I might have mentioned this to you guys last year, but did you know that most professional athletes are born in the first half of the year? The majority. Can anyone think why that is? Anyone remember why that is? Because they'll be older. 
in like an age group. Yep. Like if they're playing under 12s, then they'll be slightly older than the other class of people. Correct. Yep. And so if they're slightly older, that means they're on average bigger. And if they're on average bigger, it means they're on average better. And if they're better, then it spends, means they spend more time on the field, like let's say footy or soccer. And if they spend more time on the field, that means they have more time developing their skills. And so just on average, because of the time when they were born, they're given more opportunities at development. Isn't that fascinating? Um, so we've got athletic prowess, time born during the year, okay? And these other two, when we talk about what are the highest predictors of long-term success, what it is for you to be successful in life across many domains, okay? Across wealth and health um, and you know, uh, productivity and whether you're gonna rear children and so forth. The biggest predictors of long-term success are comps, conscientiousness, and intelligence, okay? Com what is conscientiousness? Hard work, okay? The proclivity to work hard, to try hard, to sacrifice now, for success later, okay, or for something good later. To go home and do homework, right, to do homework, do your maths homework, do all the questions. That's like, it's not something you really want to do, it's not something that gives you pleasure, but you're making a sacrifice now for a long-term gain. Um, so psychologists in here, who's heard of the marshmallow test? Can you, can you describe it? Do you know what it is? It's like you get a bunch of kids and you put a marshmallow in front of them and you say, if you wait for two minutes, you get another marshmallow. And if you don't, you eat the one now, but you don't get another one. Correct, absolutely. Okay, so we, we, I've done it with my own children. Like, it's fun, it's entertaining. Because, you know, you, they're in this room and they've got this marshmallow in front of them. It's, you know, something that's going to satisfy them completely. They're going to get so much enjoyment out of eating this one marshmallow. It's a bunch of sugar in their brain saying, eat it, eat it, eat it. And then they're going, but hang on, if I wait, if I make a sacrifice now, in one more minute, I'm going to get another marshmallow. I've doubled the amount of marshmallows that I've got. It, I mean, it's really interesting to see, see how kids deal with it. But the point of that is to say, when they assess these kids over, um, over a long period of time, okay, so th this experiment's initially done in the 70s, that those that were more ready to make sacrifice were generally speaking, across those domains we mentioned before, wealth, health, productivity, more likely to be successful. Okay, so that success is correlated with sacrifice, hard work, and intelligence, and intelligence is not something we can change, okay? Yes, it's correct you can learn things, but let's be very specific what we mean by intelligence, okay? Now, you've probably heard of IQ before. What does IQ stand for? Intellectual quotient, so it's a measure of capacity to absorb new information and recognize patterns. That's what IQ is. What's the average IQ? 100. 100 on the dot. It has a standard deviation of about 115. Uh, of about 15. Um, so, yeah. Uh, anyway, have you heard of the Flynn effect? No? So the Flynn effect says, um, on average, children perform a whole standard deviation better on IQ tests than their parents. Uh, um, and so some, some of the reasoning behind it isn't, isn't because you're smarter. Uh, it's because you're more adept at performing IQ tests. That's some of the things that I'm thinking about. Flynn effect. Okay, anyway, so talking about IQ, and when we're talking about IQ, we have two types of intelligence, right? Really, we have crystallized intelligence. And so these are things, these are processes that you've learned that you can perform without really having to think about it. So for instance, for me, that's a, that's a lot of maths, okay? I can perform without having to think about it. If you play an instrument, some of these things are sort of ingrained in your mind, they have the, the neural pathways are right there. You don't even have to have the thought, you don't even have to think about it because it's so ingrained in your muscle memory. So that's what we call crystallized intelligence, and that's also like knowing things. What things do you know? Um, and everyone can acquire that, but your ability to take on new information and your ability to recognize patterns uh, and, to, and to solve problems that you haven't experienced before, that's measured by fluid intelligence. Okay, and fluid intelligence is this intellectual quotient we're talking about. And, you know, if, if, if I've heard a number of psychologists say the same thing. If you can figure out how to change it, you're going to get a Nobel Prize. Okay, because the reality is the average IQ is 100. The standard deviation of IQ is 15. Okay, so let's talk about what that, what that means. 
Let's get a little bit mathsy for a sec. So year 10 maths, you guys remember the normal distribution. The mean is 100, the, mean, the standard deviation is 115. So then we'll go to 85, and then we'll go to um, 85 plus 57. Okay, so on a normal distribution, we have 34% of your data occur here, and we have 14% occur here, and basically 2% occur here. Um, and then the same at the same, it's symmetric about the mean, right? And so what that means is only 14% of people have an IQ of the average of 115. Right, whereas 34% of people have an IQ between 100 and 115. Notice how 50% have more than 100, 50% have lower than 100. Um, but, so if it's something you can change, then what you can do is you can make these people that find life really hard, okay? So we've said if IQ and conscientiousness are, are the best predictors of long-term success, and these people that just so happen, just so fortunate to be born with high IQ are more likely to be successful in life. So what we want to do, what can we do with these people? All right. how, can we, how can we provide them with an equal opportunity? And when, we, when you think of your own, what you're doing in year 12 at the moment, okay, you, at the end of the year, you're going to get a number, an ATAR, okay? And generally speaking, they correlate quite well with IQ tests because what is it, okay? What is that number you're going to get at the end of the year by an indication of how hard you've worked and how able you are to take in things in a reciprocal? It's, it's an IQ test. That's what this is. That's what, that's what your ATAR is at the end of the year, generally speaking, an IQ test. So people are radically different, right? And when we look at um, how, how can we provide this sort of equal opportunity, you know, with the image here, how is it that we can give everyone the same opportunity? Because it seems to be the way we measure it, the way we measure if people have the equal opportunity, is we look at the outcome. Okay, so I've got up here a number of sort of contentious things that are happening at the moment. Firstly, if you look at um, Ashkenazi Jews, so they're a subset of the Jewish population that tend to that sort of um, grew up around Europe, and they have an average IQ of 115. So that group of the population has an IQ that's a whole standard deviation higher than the whole population. The average IQ is 115. And these guys are like renowned for um, owning banks and big companies and so forth. That's where you get these conspiracies that the Jews are going to take over the world because they have these people in these high positions because their subset of the population has a high IQ. All right, so they, this group of people, have an opportunity that those that aren't born within that community don't have. They have some genetic advantage. All right, and so when we think about it in this circumstance, one way you could give other people the same opportunity is, is to prop them up, okay? But you could also chop these people down a bit. Right, you could chop their legs off to make them the same height. Okay, um, this is a lawsuit that's going on at the moment is because um, you think of Harvard, probably the, one of the most prestigious universities in America, right? And they're, um, they're getting a, they have a lawsuit against some student organization, I think it's called Students for Equal Opportunity or something like that. Because what's happening is Harvard, um, they, they have a number of criteria that they assess students coming in on, okay? And one of them is academic performance. And one of the things we have is that like almost all Asian students that apply to Harvard are academically more successful than white people of color and um, Hispanic students that apply to Harvard. Okay, almost all of them. Um, and so Harvard is discriminating against Asians by only allowing a certain amount in. All right. So if we were just going to treat them equally, we'd say, here's the academic result you need, and um, if you get that, then you can come, you can come in. All right? But they're sort of lowering the standards so that other groups of people can get in as well. Uh, another example, like if you go to, um, I went to uh, one of the universities a couple of years ago, the students were doing an engineering tour, and the walls of the engineering building are lined with posters of women in engineering. Okay, there's like a really big push in engineering, so it's a male-dominated group, 90% of people that work in engineering are men. And so there's a really big push by the universities 
to get more women into engineering. I had a student a number of years ago, I said, what are you gonna do when you finish school? She was doing mathematics. And she said, I'm doing engineering, of course. I said, oh, why is that? She said, because there's lots of jobs for women. And there are, but women are selective in engineering jobs over men because of their sex. And the same applies to men, although it's less sort of heard about. The same applies to men in fields like nursing. Okay, that nursing is dominated by women. Um, and they, they want to get more men involved in it. This is a pretty sad one. Australian prisons, okay, um, indigenous people, vastly overrepresented. So why is it that in indigenous Australians are more um, more likely to be in prison than non-indigenous Australians? So perhaps they haven't had access to the opportunities that allow them to thrive. So how is it that we can um, we can give them the same opportunities at UPA? And then even look at someone like Obama, could be anyone, but someone wealthy, someone like Obama's children, okay? You think of what kind of school are they going to? What kind of tutors are they receiving? What kind of genetic inheritance have they received from their parents? Obviously, if he's the president of the United States, he's a smart fellow, he's very cool. He's got quite um, an athletic career. So he, you know, is what you might call a, um, a, a, a genetic superhero, right? So he's got great genes and so, Generally speaking, his children are going to receive those genes as well. All right, where are we up to here? So when we think of that word discrimination, right, um, it generally has a negative connotation. Uh, but I don't think we should think of it that way because if, if discrimination is giving some people preferential treatment over others, okay? So obviously, we shouldn't treat um, our parents the same way as we treat our friends. We have a different relationship with them. We shouldn't treat our boss the same way we treat our friends because we'll probably lose our job quickly. Similarly, if you're a boss, you shouldn't treat your employees the way you treat your friends. Or as a teacher, I'm gonna treat you guys the way I teach my friends. We have a very structured relationship and the dynamics of that are very structured. Um, like what's an, an, an even more precise example is a policeman, okay? Um, a policeman shouldn't treat people that have driver's licenses the same as people that don't have driver's licenses. Right? Otherwise, they're just gonna let anyone drive. They discriminate against those that don't have driver's licenses. That discrimination can be a white, that can be a good thing, it's also a good. Okay, so. Does anyone know who this is? This is uh, this is why we're talking about this now because this has recently popped up in the news. Does anyone know? We're talking a little bit about America today. This is um, Joe Biden, so he's the president of America at the moment. That's his Supreme Court nominee. So they have a Supreme Court, which is like the highest authority in the United States, and one of their members is retiring, so he has to nominate someone. Um, and he said, um, "I'm going to nominate." a woman of colour, okay? Because I want to nominate someone who's a woman, and I want to make, want nominate someone who's of colour to the board to give them an opportunity to participate in the court. So he's nominated this woman called, um, called Kintanji Brown. Um, and so, I mean, there is a question there, like, is it fair to discriminate? Okay, so he's performed discrimination there. He's discriminated against non-people of colour and against non-females um, in, in, this, in this election. You might say, yes, it's fair because he's providing them with an opportunity. Uh, anyway, it was one thing that, the reason this is sort of doing the rounds at the moment is because she was asked. So he said, I'm gonna choose someone who's, who is a woman and who is a person of color. She was asked um, because they have to go through this thorough vetting process to make sure that they're suitable to be a candidate for the Supreme Court. She was asked, um, can you tell me what a woman is? Okay, so that's a question that's sort of circulating in here at the moment. What is a woman? Okay, um, and she said, so you know, she's nominated because she's a woman. She said, I, um, I don't know what a woman is. I'm not a biologist. Um, now, one of the problems with her answer, so she wanted to remain neutral, obviously. She didn't want to sort of take one strong position or the other and she didn't want to get herself in trouble. 
But this, this is quite um, quite telling her her statement. I don't know. I'm not a biologist. Why why is it telling? Because it insinuates that um, what a woman is has something to do with biology. Right? Whereas I think lots of people would disagree with that. Um, what else do we want to say about her? And so then, then of course, the internet um, just gets stormed by memes. Okay. So, is it raining? How should I know? I'm not a meteorologist. Um, I'm not a vet, but I know what a dog is, okay? But, I think it's an important question, okay? Because if we're talking about what is a human, and we sort of, we offer different ideas, and then we're going to say, well, what is a woman? And I can think of two, two competing explanations. So, one is to say it's strictly biological. Okay, so that is a, it's a scientific explanation. A woman is something that's biological, and so science can offer a solution. And another one might be, um, anyone, what, what is a woman? Anyone that identifies as a woman. Uh, does anyone have any other idea? I mean, they're, off, they're, they're not mutually exclusive, so there's more options. But they, these are sort of two competing options, I think. What do you, so that's the question. What is a woman? And you can say, well, it depends on the biology. You can say the sex organs. You can say the, um, the genetic code, the chromosomes. Obviously, this is an important question. Okay, it's an important question. I'll show you why in a moment. But, um, and then if, you know, if we have this one, any, any, anyone that identifies as a woman, uh, and so this is where probably like a temptation might be to say yes, this is the answer because um, because then it allows people to sort of choose their identity, choose who they are, and that might seem like a good thing to give people their equal opportunity to declare themselves. Anyone that identifies as one, but one problem with this is okay is that it's used the word in the definition. Okay, so if I said um, what is a car. And you were to say, a car is a thing that is a car. Or, if, if, even if you were to say, a car is a thing that, um, I, that I identify as a car. Has that, and it hasn't answered the question, it has just said, I mean, you could say the same thing about a table. A table is a thing that I identify as a table. So, I mean, this is a, this is a this is a question, and let's let's say why it's important, and let's maybe talk about can we come up with any other solution? Why is it an important question? Okay, firstly, bathrooms, all right? And I mean, it goes both ways. Okay, got, the, the question obviously goes both ways. What is a man? What is a woman? And choosing a woman because it's easy to demonstrate the point of contention. Okay, so firstly, bathrooms, all right? So can someone just um, say that they're a woman and walk into a bathroom? Is so that's the next one, prisons. Okay, maybe you guys heard the story of the, um, the person in, in the UK who's, who was a man in a male prison and said, I identify as a female, got transferred to the female prison and then impregnated three inmates there because he raped, he raped them. Um, so that, so this is it's an important question because we've got to deal with this. We've got to deal with this, we've got to deal with this. Sports competition, so the, the other ones um, that's the scourge of the internet at the moment is the American swimmer, Leah Thomas. You guys heard of her? Yeah, okay, so that's um, attracting a lot of attention. So again, a, a, a man competed in male swimming, um, not overly successful, transitioned, now female, competed in female swimming, and then won, I'm not sure, exactly sure, but won some events, but what is that, the US Female Championships. Um, and then, like, furthermore, the question of, like, well, when, when are we going to allow, um, you know, when, when is a suitable age for people to recognise that they can perform these physical things on their body? And if we restrict tattoos to the age of 18, is it, it's substantially different from a tattoo, you might argue. Uh, and hormone therapy. So it's an important question, all right? What is a woman? And, you know, this is a, it's a simple answer. But the world is a very complex place, isn't it? The world is a very complex place, and maybe it's not, maybe it's not a suitable answer. And this 
if, if this is the answer, then, um, then, then it means nothing. Or, like, to be a woman means nothing. Because it, any, anything can. Um, so what is, what are the, what's the restrictions of the domain thing? Um, is, is, it, is it some objective reality? Or is it something that's just internal in itself? I don't know, do, do you guys have any ideas? Yeah. I'd say it's objective, but like, say, because like the gender dysphoria thing, like that's an objective thing. Yes. So it's still objective. Yes, yeah, yeah. It's so true. gender dysphoria as a objective, um, and, and what, and, uh, and uh, dysphoria. Okay, so that is the, um, that's the, the, the condition of believing you're in the, the wrong body. Yep. Um, yep, so that being an, an objective condition. Yeah. Um, an objective category. Yep. Um, yep. So it's, it's an objective reality. Um, and how, how do you assess whether someone has gender dysphoria? I mean, that, that's probably not a question for you guys. It's more of a more of a, a, a psychologist question, you might say. Is is the tool of assessment just whether they feel that way or not? Yeah. Because if it, if it is just whether they feel that way, then it's subjective, isn't it? Yeah. Um, but if it's... Yeah. I understand your reluctance to talk about it. I'm reluctant to talk about it. It's an important question. Well, if it's categorised as like a disease and disease is like mental or even use your property like say if you're going to diagnose someone with anorexia they yeah. show symptoms yes or depression they show symptoms yes yep. so maybe so looking at um that's that's aristotle isn't it you know it's like how do we know what a thing is by what it does okay so how do we know if someone has anorexia well are they exhibiting these, pro these properties how do we know if someone's gender dysphoric are they exhibiting these properties yep yep so so um so then what are the properties that would exhibit womanness? Because then, then we can start to define anyone what a woman is. I think that's completely subjective. You reckon just completely subjective? Yep. It's yep. what so woman is. Just a com so um, You're completely just a um, like you'd agree with this one, any anyone that identifies as a woman? Yeah. Yep, yeah. yep. Yeah. Um, yeah. I think that's why it's so hard to define. It's hard, it's very hard to define, mm. yeah, otherwise. Yeah. And so, um, yeah, and, and so if that's right, then, um, then, what, then, uh, yeah, we need to solve these problems, don't we? Um, so, uh, so here's another one, um, like, it, if he just makes the statement, I'm a female, that's what this guy did to show the fallacies of the argument. It's a very quotation of this from his poems. I don't know who this guy is, do you guys want to introduce him? So he's a rapper, identifies as a female. Um, so he went on camera, said, I'm a female now, and then lifted these weights, um, and then turned the camera off and stopped identifying as a, as a female. Has he broken the female weightlifting record? Or? Just idiots going with everyone else. Mm. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So he's been an idiot. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. Anyway, so it's a. Uh, it's a complex world, isn't it? Um, 